Well, hello to everyone and welcome to another edition of PolyAge Power Hour. I'm Christine Davies, the founder and CEO of PolyAge, which is the world's first online marketplace for policy insights and government affairs services, uh, directly connecting companies and organizations with an exceptional network of public policy and government affairs experts who are available for flexible pay-as-you-go consultations and other advisory services across a full spectrum uh, of issues and topics. Our PolyGage Power Hour webinar programming aims to provide expert assessment of key policy and political issues at all levels of government, helping companies and organizations gain greater knowledge uh, to form more effective government and public affairs strategies, utilizing the well-earned knowledge of the members of the PolyGage Experts Network to really help you, we hope, focus on what needs to be top of mind regarding important government activities and how to effectively engage on them. We want these discussions to be as helpful to those of you joining us live as possible, so please feel free to submit questions at any time using the chat or the Q&A buttons uh, that you should see at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And thank you to those of you who submitted questions in advance uh, when you registered. Those are at the top of the list uh, to try and tackle today. Our Power Hour topic today, the state of U.S. tax policy, uh, is one that touches all of us, regardless of industry or function. And with a still relatively new U.S. administration and new congressional leadership pushing for a new robust policy agenda, not to mention the impacts of the pandemic, uh, on government spending and the economy as a whole, tax policy is once again on the front burner, uh, although it may never be off the front burner. I think we'll discuss that a bit today as well. We're fortunate to have two exceptionally experienced experts helping us navigate this tax policy topic today, Ken Keyes and Juanita Dugan. Ken is the managing director of the Federal Policy Group who provides sophisticated strategy and technical tax advice to a range of clients on tax policy matters before the US Congress, the Treasury Department, the IRS, and the OECD. Ken has delivered significant legislative and regulatory results for his clients, uh, including efforts to enact legislation responding to the World Trade Organization's ruling against US foreign sales corporation benefits, to avert enactment of broad corporate tax shelter legislation and to reverse Treasury Department regulations that targeted hybrid arrangements uh, for U.S. national corporations, among many other achievements. Ken earlier served as Chief of Staff to the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation, where he was responsible for developing and analyzing all tax legislation for the House Ways and Means Committee, the Senate Finance Committee, and other committees. And he also earlier served as Chief Republican Tax Counsel to the House Ways and Means Committee directly. Ken has also been co-managing partner of the Washington National Tax Services Office of PricewaterhouseCoopers and firm-wide chair of the tax practice for Baker Hostetler. Quite a biography. And Ken, we're so glad to have you with us. And then Juanita Dugan, who is the founder of Clarified, an advisory firm through which she helps advise clients and boards to navigate and develop clarity around complex policy, political, regulatory, reputation, compliance, and communication challenges. Most recently, Juanita was president and CEO of the National Federation for Independent Business, or NFIB, which is the nation's leading small business advocacy group. And under Juanita's leadership, the NFIB played a key role in the passage of the largest tax reform bill for small businesses in decades. Juanita has had an extensive career in the government affairs realm. She was the first female to lead the American Apparel and Footwear Association, the American Forest and Paper Association, and the Wine and Spirits Wholesalers of America, all organizations with extensive tax agendas. Uh, Juanita also had a leading role as a lobbyist at Brownstein Hyatt, uh, for the National Food Processors Association and for the Philip Morris companies during that transformative period that we all remember that included the National Tobacco Settlement. Uh, Juanita has also served in the White House under two presidential administrations. And I have to say, she has been a wonderful and intrepid advisor to Polly Gage uh, over the last year. So Juanita, delighted to have you with us as well. 
And let me turn to you to get us started uh, and to begin what I know will be a terrific conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christine. I really appreciate that. Um, mostly what my bio proves is that um, I've been in Washington for probably too long. Um, but I have had the opportunity um, for many years to work with Ken Keyes, and I'm thrilled to be on this Polygage Power Hour with him. I'm also really pleased to be part of the Polygage Experts Network because I really believe that Polygage is going to change the way institutions access expertise in the influence realm. And I think it's going to give a voice to companies and causes that previously could not find or could not afford to be represented, and it will give voice. So again, uh, Ken and I've worked together for more than two decades, of course, with me as the client. And I can say that he is the tax oracle. And I feel like I'm not worthy, but I'm proud to be on the stage with you. Ken's gonna get into the details of the tax proposals that are swirling around the administration and the Congress. But I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, before he talks to refresh our memories about how the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came together in 2017, its main provisions, and a look at the state of the economy after taxpayers filed under it for the first time in 2019 leading into 2020. Uh, it's no secret that tax policy in large part uh, determines economic behavior and the proposals coming from the Biden White House and Congress represent almost an opposite day approach from the policies that were enacted in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017. Moreover, they come at a time when the economy is in the beginning of a very fragile recovery. And if you couple that with the unpaid spending and the soaring deficit that started under Donald Trump and is continuing under President Biden uh, with more and more to come, you just wrap your head around the fact that Senator Sanders is preparing a budget package of $6 trillion um, that might allow two more reconciliation bills. And I know today's um, infrastructure deal might change that calculation a little bit, but in theory, they've got two, two bites at that apple. And try to remember when we thought that the Obama rescue package in 2008 of 750 billion was a lot of money. We thought that was a huge number. It almost seems quaint now. And both parties have pretty much you know, given up on the fiscal discipline and it's a pox in both houses. They're, you know, it's, it's not unique to any party anymore. But the whole dynamic right now with fiscal policy and tax policy is a really big gamble that Americans in the wake of COVID um, have gotten used to this kind of spending and will support or even tolerate high spending and high taxes going forward. So a little bit about the background of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act because Ken and I worked very hard on that bill when I was president of NFIB. And I will say for, for myself, I think what we achieved there together was one of the most important things I've ever done in my career. Um, GOP consensus on tax policy was clear long before 2016, before you know, that election. And it was centered on lowering individual rates, lowering the corporate rates, increasing the standard deduction, eliminating the estate tax, eliminating the alternative minimum tax, reducing automatic deductions, repatriation of profits, full expensing, the list goes on and on. And the bill that ultimately passed did incorporate a lot of these priorities. But the central priority was always lowing individual rates and the corporate rate on the theory that corporations are taxed twice. And Ken can explain, um, that is true in theory, but it actually doesn't happen much in practice. But one of the things that no one was talking about um, was how to give small businesses, particularly pass-throughs like LLCs and sub S's, a meaningful tax cut that would be on par with large corporate tax cut which turned out to be 21%. And since there are about 29 million small businesses in the country, and about three quarters of them are organized as pass-throughs, this was a big problem, particularly for NFIB. We'd go up and talk to people about this, and the response was always, the bill is gonna create a combination of incentives, and you take advantage of those incentives and you will probably get a tax cut. I mean, there was no way that you could promise somebody a tax cut in, if you were a pass-through. You had to take advantage of various things. Um, and at the time, I just thought that was woefully inaccurate. You would be able to give a C-Corp a specific amount that you know that they would say 
and you would never be able to make that same statement for a small business. And basically, this, this message was, well, you can buy a really big piece of equipment and die, and you might get a tax cut. And I just, I just didn't think that that was a way forward for, um, for the small business advocacy. So it was at that point where I started to frame the problem as parity between big and small businesses. And I wasn't trying to pick a fight, but I needed to make this very clear what was happening. Um, but by the time the House considered the tax bill, uh, particularly in the Ways and Means uh, Committee, um, there just wasn't there just wasn't much in there for small business. There was nothing specific. I remember at 5.30 on the morning of the last day of the markup, uh, we, we got a couple of concessions um, with the committee, but it, it, it was complicated and it, it, there were just a lot of things wrong with it. So NFIB really wasn't in the position to, to um, support the bill, which was odd for NFIB to be opposing a Republican tax bill. Um, and Ken and I you know, talked to anybody who would listen until we were blue in the face and we probably wore out about three pairs of shoes going all over Capitol Hill and to the White House and the Treasury Department, um, trying to convince them that there was just this huge missed opportunity to help the sector that is half of the economy. It's one half of the payroll and it creates two out of every three new jobs. And it's just not a good look not to take care of and treat it on par with the large C-Corps. So over in the Senate, we were very lucky because Senator Orrin Hatch, who was the chairman of the Finance Committee, immediately understood the problem and he understood the optics. And he miraculously, almost right there, um, he crafted a very clean and very simple 20% deduction for qualified business income for pass-throughs in a new section 199 cap A of the tax code. It was revolutionary and it was key to the passage of the bill. By the time it was signed, there was a $414 billion tax cut for pass-throughs directed exactly at the sweet spot of the middle-class taxpayer, according to the distribution tables. And in my mind, this was the single most important part of the bill. And even though it expires in 2025, um, the most important thing for us is that at the end of the day, the effective tax rate for those payers was around 19%. So we did, we did even better by a little bit than what the corporate um, rate was reduced to 21%. So Ken and I were both very proud of that. Um, and by the time January 2020 rolled around, after Americans had filed for the first time under the new law and saw the benefits, the economy was on fire, largely due to that tax cut, in my opinion. The Small Business Op Optimism Index exceeded its previous record set in 1983. I never thought I would see uh, numbers that exceeded what Ronald Reagan was able to do in the 80s, but um, it happened in August of 2018. Retail sales were through the roof and consumer confidence was way high. The stock market hit record highs. The unemployment rate was a 50 year low. The labor force participation rate was climbing and that was one of the worst parts about um, unemployment um, in the years before. And real wages were going up for the first time in decades. And then in two months, it collapsed, and you know the rest of that story. But five COVID bills later, um, at a cost of $5.6 trillion and another $6 trillion in proposed spending, uh, the deficit hit $660 billion for one month in March. Um, and most importantly, on August 1, the debt ceiling expires. So that's going to be a very interesting exercise. And on this very dark note, I will give the floor to Ken. Thanks. Well, thanks Juanita. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about the debt ceiling. Um, but the first thing I thought I would do is walk us through kind of the key aspects of the Biden tax proposals uh, because they are pretty seismic. Uh, in their potential impact if they were to be enacted into law. And, but let me start, because I know this is probably on the minds of everybody who's listening, um, as to what is the likelihood that these provisions do get enacted into law. And I would say right now, it's less than 50-50. Part of the reason is that Democrats have some significant obstacles in their way 
in the form of uh, how narrow <clears throat> the House is and how narrow the Senate is. And everybody talks about the Senate because it's 50-50. The House is really narrow as well. And if you just want to see how narrow it is, about four Thursdays ago, Speaker Pelosi put a bill on the floor, $1.9 billion, billion, not trillion, $1.9 billion for security for the U.S. Capitol in the aftermath of January 6. It passed 213 to 212. So the question I would leave with you is, if Pelosi could only get 213 to 212 to fund 1.9 billion for security for the US Capitol, how is she gonna pass two, three, four trillion of tax increases? So I think she has big, there's big problems in the House, but in the Senate, there's big problems as well because it's 50-50. And everybody talks about Joe Manchin from West Virginia. And I'll tell you what I've heard from 12 different Republican senators over the past six months in separate conversations. And it's eerie how they say the same thing about Senator Manchin. He's only with us when we don't need him. That's not what they say about Kirsten Sinema from Arizona. They say she's tough as nails and won't vote for any tax increases. So that's problem number one. And that's the reason I'm at 50, uh, less than 50% that this gets enacted. Um, but the other issue, and this happens in Washington every now and then, both the Democrats and the Republicans on this whole topic have a secret plan. And the problem with secret plans is they tell everybody what their secret plan is. So the secret plan for Democrats is go ahead and pass a bipartisan stimulus package. And you may have read the headlines just an hour or so ago that at the White House, they announced they have a deal on infrastructure. Uh, curiously, they still have not been able to explain how they're gonna pay for it. Um, but the secret plan for Republicans is agree to a bipartisan infrastructure bill, pass it, and then it'll be possible to stop Biden and Democrats from doing anything else. Um, but they've shared their secret plan. So the Democrats know that's their secret plan. The secret plan for Democrats is pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill, and then we come behind and do a reconciliation bill where we do everything else. But they've disclosed their secret plan too. So both sides know what the other side's secret plan is. Okay. So with that backdrop, let me quickly take you through kind of the major items in the Pre President Biden's tax plan. And let's advance to the next slide after this. Okay, so you're gonna see some of these in blue and you're gonna see some of them in red. Now, let me explain what color coding is. Um, when I was at Baker and Hosteller in the late 90s, it's a 10 story building at Connecticut and L in Washington, DC. We were getting bomb threats about every week and the police would call and they had two methods or systems for telling us how serious the bomb threat was. If it was code red, and I have no idea how they categorize these, but if it was code red, the message was, eh, we got a bomb threat. We're not sure it's serious. You might want to leave the building, but you really don't have to. If it was code blue. It was get out of the building. And if you don't get out, we're sending the police dogs in to drag you out. Now, keep in mind that we left the building and stood on the sidewalk in front of a 10 story building, all glass. Had the bomb exploded, we would have been up to our necks in glass. So our behavior in response, even to Code Blue, was not too sensical. Um, just in case you're wondering where the bomb threats were coming from, after a year, we discovered it was a garage attendant who was trying to go home early. All right, so, so here's the color coding. Uh, first item up, rate increases. Uh, Biden wants to increase top rates from where they are right now, which is 39.6, this is on ordinary income, to 43.4. Now, a quick observation here, it's amazing to me how many people do not understand what their top individual rate is. Everybody thinks it's 37. It's actually 40.4 because of the surtax that was enacted in the Affordable Care Act. If Biden achieves his rate increase, it would not go just to 39.6, it would go to 43.4.
okay, let's, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna go through all these items, but let's go down the chart to the first red item, the value of itemized deductions. If you take a mortgage interest deduction or charitable deduction, the tax benefit is based on what your marginal rate is, your top margin rate. So if your top margin rate's 40% and you deduct $10,000 of home mortgage interest, then you reduce your taxes by $4,000, 40% 40 of 10,000. Biden has a proposal to cap the benefit at 28%. So even if you're at the 40% marginal rate bracket, your tax benefit will no longer be 4,000, it will be 2,800. Now, it's, uh, Biden really talked about this a lot when he was campaigning, the, the two times that he campaigned. Uh, just kidding, it was three. Um, so it was interesting when the so-called Green Book, which is this book Treasury uh, releases every year, uh, generally, it describes the president's tax proposals in detail, which was released May 28th, it did not include the cap on itemized deductions. Do not assume you've seen the last of this idea. Let's move to the next item, which Juanita highlighted, the pass-through deduction. No, let's go back. The bottom line, the bottom item, the pass-through deduction, the 20% deduction for pass-through businesses, section 199 cap A, Biden and his presidential campaign platform proposed repealing it for everybody above 400,000. Again, interestingly, was not in the green book, but two weeks ago, a treasury official, when asked about that said, you haven't seen the last of this idea. So you can't assume we're not gonna see it later this year. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is kind of a big deal. IRA and 401k contributions, uh, the Biden plan would limit those to essentially a 26% credit instead of uh, the value of whatever is your marginal rate. Didn't show up in the green book. Again, don't assume you haven't, you've seen the last of that. Next item down, this is a code blue because this is a seriously big deal. The Biden plan would remove the cap applicable to the social security tax, which is 15.3% on individuals. The current cap is 137,000. So you only pay that 15.3% up to 137,000. By the way, the value of your social security benefits reflects the amount of tax that you paid. Biden plan would lift the cap for people above 400,000, but would not increase your social security benefit. So it on its own would be a 15.3% percentage increase in income above 400,000. That's why it's a code blue item. Uh, didn't show up in the green book and also would be very difficult to do under the so-called reconciliation system, which is what the Democrats are planning to use, but not impossible. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Cap gains and dividends, a big deal. To lots of people probably on this call. The current top rate is 23.8. Oh, the press repeatedly says it's 20. That's because the press doesn't pay this rate. Um, they don't have dividends and cap gains, I guess, but it's actually 23.8. The Biden plan would raise that to 43.4 for, in, for income above a million. That, this was in the green book. Uh, it's the, the Green Book said the effective date of this proposal is for realizations after date of announcement. And you wonder, what does that mean? We're pretty sure what that means is April 28, which was when Biden kind of released a description of these proposals. Uh, it's a little weird to use the term realizations for the payment of dividends, because realizations is normally a term used to describe capital gains because you sell an asset and you realize a gain. Uh, the Treasury was asked after the Green Book came out, do you mean for dividends the same date? And astonishingly, they refused to provide a clarification. Now, let me just make a prediction. If this proposal actually goes to a markup in the Ways and Means Committee, which is the tax writing committee in the House, I think it's very possible that at that time, they will advance the effective date to the date of committee action. But let me just warn you, 
don't run out and start selling your stock because Ken Key said they might advance the date to the data committee action. No guarantee that will happen. And let me just also remind you, even though people say keenly, Congress doesn't like to do tax increases retroactively. The last time Congress did an increase in the individual rate, 1993 under Bill Clinton, it was signed into law April 12, 1993, and it was retroactive to January 1, 1993. Okay, same slide we're on. Let's go down to the second item from the bottom, basis step up. This is a code blue because it's a seriously big deal. Under current law, if you die and leave assets to your heirs, <clears throat> they get a tax basis equal to the fair market value at the time of your death. So if they sell it subsequently, they have to pay capital gain tax on the appreciation that you re they, they receive after the receipt of the asset. Under the proposal by the Biden administration, it would not only eliminate the step up in basis of death, they would impose a capital gain tax on the estate of the decedent. So think about Jeff Bezos. He dies, let's say he has 80 billion of stock. It has a zero basis. The current cap, top capital gains rate is going to be over 40%. So he would pay, his estate would owe $32 billion. Um, but in addition, his estate would have to pay the estate tax. So the combination of the estate tax and this capital gain tax would mean the effective tax burden on the death of, of someone with appreciated assets would be in the 60 to 70% range. Um, my own view is the basis step up is gonna have a very difficult time actually finding its way into law, assuming that a tax bill comes together uh, under reconciliation later this year. Okay, let's move to the next slide. A wealth tax. We've heard a lot about a wealth tax, particularly after the pro publica release of a couple of weeks ago about all those nasty billionaires not paying any tax or paying very low rates of tax. Um, just so you know, the top 1% do pay 40 plus percent 60 plus percent of the income tax. Um, why do the wealthy not pay a tax? It's because they haven't sold their assets. They haven't realized the gain. You can tax them on that gain, but then what are you gonna do if the assets go down in value? So far the wealth tax, which is a big Elizabeth Warren uh, uh, proposal, hasn't gotten any traction and there isn't, there wasn't a wealth tax in the Biden plan. Uh, but let me just say all the, discussion of the ProPublica release, which by the way is a criminal violation, publishable, punishable by five years in prison. Um, with all that attention, you can't just assume wealth taxes aren't gonna pop up somewhere. Mark to market. This is a really radical idea that would require you at the end of each year to take all of your assets calculate the amount of appreciation that it occurred during the tax year, which is typically the calendar year, pay tax on the gain, even though you haven't sold those assets. Uh, Biden didn't have this, but Ron Wyden, who's chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, is a big fan of this. Um, so uh, this would also be fairly radical. Uh, last item on this slide is increasing the estate tax. Uh, it's generally assumed that re Democrats will want to raise the uh, estate tax back above 40 percent. They're, they're going to want to reduce the exclusion amount, which is currently 11.5 million uh, per joint filer. Uh, the Biden plan uh, didn't actually have an increase in the estate tax, but you can't assume we're not going to see that if there is a tax bill later this year. OK, let's go to the next slide. Okay, top rate on corporations, currently 21%. The Biden plan had 28%. Uh, Biden has already backpedaled on this. Uh, Manchin has said he couldn't go any higher than 25%. Biden seems like he's backpedaled to the point where he's not even pushing for an increase in the top corporate rate and instead wants to impose a 15% minimum tax uh, on a worldwide income. 
uh, which is a really complicated thing. So this is a whole area that's in massive flux. Um, so stay tuned on this one uh, because it seems to be changing by the day. All right, let's go to the next slide. So I'm just gonna quickly run through what the Biden plan would mean for the top marginal rate, depending on what your state tax rate is, just so you can get a flavor for how dramatic the Biden plan would increase your top marginal rate. If you're lucky enough to be in one of those states that has no state income tax, like Nevada, Texas, Florida, gosh, I wonder why everybody's moving from New York to Florida. But if you're in one of those states, your current law top marginal rate is 40.8 because that's the corp that's the uh, the federal rate. Under the Biden plan, it would go to 55.8, which is a 38.4 percent, four six percent increase. Let's go to scenario two. If you're in a state, scenario two, our next slide. Under scenario two, which we're going <laughs> to there it is. Um, I've used the average state income tax rate, which is 6.31%. So under current law, your top marginal rate is 47.11. Under Biden, it would go to 62.11, which is a 31.84% increase. But now let's go to slide three, for scenario three, the next slide. This is for those of you in California. The message, in case you're confused, is pack your bags, leave get across the border as fast as you can to Nevada or to Texas. And by the way, the people in Texas aren't wild about those people coming from California because they're coming with all their crazy ideas. But when you look at this slide, you'll know why they might be leaving. Under current law, the top marginal rate in California is 54.11. Under the Biden plan, it would go to 69.1, almost 70%, which is a 27.73% increase over what is already the highest marginal rate for taxpayers in the country. So that's a quick snapshot of what's in the Biden plan. As I said, uh, the world in Washington is in massive flux um, about where all this is going. And it's clearly partly uh, impacted by whether this so-called bipartisan infrastructure plan comes together or not. Uh, but I'll go out on a limb because I make this prediction every year about this time. The most likely date for Congress to adjourn for the year is the Friday before Christmas. And I regret to inform anyone who's going to be following this stuff that the Friday before Christmas, yes, is December 24th, Christmas Eve. So that's what I think we have to look forward to between now and the end of the year. So Juanita, back to you. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, I think we have a few questions coming in, but um, before that, um, I would like you to talk about what the scenario looks like in August when a tax bill may or may not have passed, an infrastructure bill may or may not have passed, um, the family plan might or might not have passed. Um, what is the situation, do you think, with uh, the debt limit? Debt limit is, um, is a situation where everybody everybody gets a hostage and all of a sudden very few people have any leverage or you might say they have more leverage than they ever had, but it's very much sort of a, um, a equalizing event for, for all the parties involved. Um, what do you see will be the advantage for the Democrats and what do you think would be the advantage of the Republicans? Okay, so let me first explain what is the current debt ceiling situation. Um, the last time around that we, we're going to run up against the, the total amount of borrowing that the federal government could have. The, the Congress acted to lift the debt ceiling. So there is no debt ceiling currently in place. Now, just in case you're wondering, it doesn't mean Treasury can just go out and borrow uh, untold amounts of money. They can only borrow as much as they actually need. Um, but on July, August 1, the debt ceiling is re in, in, put back in place. Um, uh, Janet Yellen, who's the Secretary of the Treasury, is running all over Capitol Hill, and I actually ran into her going into the Dirksen Senate office building yesterday, and she, I, honest to God, she's about three feet tall. 
um, it's, it's unbelievable. No, normally, this is something you may know. Secrets, the Secret Service provides protection for Secretaries of Treasury and so on. They usually try and pick a Secret Service person that looks like the protectee on the theory that if some crazy person decides they're going to shoot them, they don't know which one to shoot at. Apparently, the Secret Service doesn't have any agents that small, what I saw yesterday, okay? But Janet Yellen's ran all over the hill doing what every Secretary of the Treasury does about this time, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, screaming as loud as they can, we need to raise the debt ceiling right now. We have to do it right now. They are always lying, okay? And again, Democrat and Republican secretaries do this. So what's the situation gonna be on August 1? On August 1, the cash surplus of the Treasury Department, according to their own release of about a month ago will be $450 billion, okay? In addition to the $450 billion of cash they have laying around, they have the ability to do what's now referred to as extraordinary measures. Extraordinary measures generally refers to going all over the Treasury Department and looking at every desk drawer to see how much cash is stored in them. But it really involves selling off pension fund assets and everything. Generally, these extraordinary measures can buy weeks, if not months of time. And here's what makes the situation even harder to predict. That is, how do you predict when they really need to address the debt ceiling? If they get to September 15th, that's when estimated tax payments are due from both individuals and corporations for the third quarter. If they get to September 15th, it probably buys them time into October. So predicting when exactly Congress has to act is, is very hard on this topic. Um, and then what makes it even more complicated is when the House leaves for their August recess, they do not come back until September 19th. Let me just say, these people are killing themselves. I don't know how they can keep up this work schedule, okay? But they don't even come back to September 19th. So if Congress doesn't address the debt ceiling before the August recess, and based on past history, they only, Congress ever deals with this when they absolutely have to, this could easily go September or even into October. What Yellen would dearly like to have happen is for Congress to address it before they leave for the August recess, uh, possibly under a reconciliation vehicle, but that would be very difficult to make happen because they need to pass a budget resolution, reconciliation instructions. So we're going to clearly, probably, I'll be astonished if we're not still talking about this in September, maybe even into October. I will say it will be market moving um, because the press, who are complete morons most of the time on a good day, will write about the fact that the Treasury going to default on its debt. That is never what happens. It's only you can't borrow more. But they use the term default to loose shorthand to describe that you can't borrow more. They're two kind of different things, to be honest, okay? Um, but they'll start writing those articles. They're already writing them now. They'll really start writing them toward the end of July. In August, they take off too. So when they get back in September, they'll start writing them again and the stock market will start bouncing up and down as people worry about the fault. Um, and, and so September is likely to be a roller coaster ride because Congress is also gonna have to agree uh, on a continuing resolution to fund the federal government for the next fiscal year that become, uh, starts October 1. Again, I said the House isn't back till September 19. The Senate's only in session 12 days. Uh, it's it's pretty. If you really like train wrecks, this is this could be a, a good one. So that that's kind of the situation on the debt ceiling, Juanita. Well, I remember the last time there was a fiscal cliff and no appropriations bill on the debt ceiling uh, altogether, and it was a very painful period for everyone involved. Um, Christine, can we see if we have some questions coming in? We do, Juanita. We have one asking about whether a wealth tax, uh, particularly as proposed by Senator Warren, might be ruled as unconstitutional. So that's actually a really good question. Um, but let me start by saying, when the best argument you have for not doing something is the Constitution, you've normally lost. 
okay? And unfortunately, the Congress kind of used the Constitution as this meddlesome hindrance to what is otherwise things that they think are really great to do. Um, but this, this is a serious constitutional question because when we had passed, I believe, the 16th Amendment that provided for an income tax, it's a tax on income and a wealth tax is not a tax on income. But if you ask Elizabeth Warren, whether that's of any concern to her, her response would be no, because we want to add four new justices to the Supreme Court and they'll just ignore the constitution, okay? But it's a serious question. And, uh, um, but unfortunately, for the Bernie Sanders of the world and the Elizabeth Warrens of the world, um, that's just a minor obstacle. For Kirsten Cinema, it's not a minor obstacle. Uh, it's a showstopper. And it would, I think it would be a show, as, as critical sort of a, as I was of Joe Manchin. I can't imagine it's something that he would have any enthusiasm for. Just to be clear, there's probably a lot of other Democrats in the Senate who aren't going to come out and say it, but they're not enthused about it either. Juanita, we also have a question that's come in asking how the current uh, discussions related to the infrastructure bill, particularly the uh, announcement last night and maybe further this morning, how will, what is the trickle down effect looking to be in terms of uh, what, that, what that will mean for tax policy? Well, it was kind of what I talked about at the outset, which is the two sides have these secret plans, which everybody now knows. So but the Republicans, with the Republicans, and by the way, the progressives, which by the way, progressives is the new word for liberal because they didn't like being called liberals. They changed their name to progressives. Um, a better word would have been crazy. Um, but, 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 but the progressives know that they're about to get schnookered here. And they really are worried Biden is gonna be the one that yanks the rug out from under them. Because if they actually are able to pass this bipartisan infrastructure bill, it really is going to make it hard for them subsequently to get a reconciliation bill that can pass the House and pass the Senate. Um, now, is the infrastructure deal real? I have serious doubts that the papers are anything other than smoke and mirrors. Um, even the reporting after the meeting at the White House today, still very, very vague in terms of what the papers are. But somewhere in 24 to 48 hours, I think this gang of 20 or 21 is going to actually have to come clean and say what their pay fors are. And that's where that's when we're going to start to find out whether this is real or is it just kind of a charade. Well, the last time I looked this afternoon, the deal is worth just under a trillion dollars, something like 950. And one of the pay fors that's been discussed a lot is uh, the tax gap, which is the difference between what is owed to the IRS and what they actually collect. And there is uh, part of that discussion is giving the IRS about 40 to $50 million dollars to collect. Bill billion. Billion. 140, <laughs> $140 billion, 40 to 50 billion, um, so that they can collect 100 billion. So that's only 50 billion net net, and that doesn't come close to paying for a trillion dollar bill. And they also have another proposal that is really scary, and it was in the Green Book. And it's a proposal that would require every financial institution in America, and that would include banks, credit unions, but it would also include stockbrokers, any institution that takes cash in from their customers, puts it in accounts, uses it, and takes it back out it would require them to share all of that uh, trail of cash with the IRS. Now I can tell you, because I've worked on compliance issues going back 40 years. If the IRS got all this information, they wouldn't have any idea what to do with it. They don't have the computer capacity. They have no idea. But the green book, which I mentioned earlier, it, said this will raise 400 to 450 billion over 10 years. Now, what the treasury in their green book says about what it would raise is not really terribly relevant. What matters is what the Joint Committee on Taxation staff says is their revenue estimate 
and led that staff, I, I would be shocked that they would agree with these numbers uh, from the Treasury Department on this particular proposal. Uh, but, but moreover, I, I think as members of Congress get their head around what it would involve to have all this money flowing through these financial, all this information going to the Treasury Department, they're gonna have a very ta hard time accepting it. And exhibit A is Senator Crapo, who's the senior Republican, on the finance committee, when Yellen testified in front of the committee on June 16, in his opening statement, he devoted several paragraphs to severely criticizing this proposal and pointed to the ProPublica release as one of the many reasons that this would be a bad idea because of the concern that if ProPublica can get all those tax returns from all those people, then they can also get this information. And at least, and Crapo was very critical of it. But I think there's a number of Democrats in the House and Senate that will also be nervous about the prospect of the IRS having all this information. But the real point I'm trying to make is, I don't know what the IRS would do with it if they had it. Um, and I'm guessing the IRS, if they were candid with you, would say the same thing. Christine, do we have any more questions? Yep, we have a question that's come in asking for Ken's perspective on where things stand with the discussion of the global minimum tax uh, and if there is any update on a tax policy agenda uh, emerging from the OECD. Okay, so this is a great question. Um, Janet Yellen, since the beginning of the year, has given a speech anywhere in the world where two or more people are gathered to talk about how important it is to have a 15% global minimum tax. In order to actually implement it, the OECD, which operates on a consensus basis, which means everyone has to agree. And in the OECD has, I don't know, 130 countries, something like that. Um, and there was the G7 meeting that occurred in London uh, just uh, uh, two weekends ago, where the G7 endorsed this. Um, but there is, and then there's another meeting coming up the middle of July. There is a huge difference between, you know, the G7 getting together in Cornwall, uh, where, by the way, there's been a rapid COVID outbreak since those people were there. So thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> there's a big difference between the G7 or the G20 getting together and say, yeah, put us down for this and it actually becoming law. And here's the risk for US companies. If the world, if, if we agree to a 15% global minimum tax and it would be on a country by country basis, and that's a really big deal. You wouldn't get to aggregate all your income and say, as long as I'm paying an aggregate of 15% on my total income. No, it'd have to be country by country. If the United States does this and the rest of the world doesn't follow and and let, let me explain something about the rest of the world. When Italy says, we have a 20% marginal rate on corporations, that's not what they really have. What they have in Italy is, make me an offer. And so you, you your first return filing is like their first offer. And then you kind of negotiate from, in the United States, believe it or not, notwithstanding the ProPublica and everybody else, most corporate tax managers religiously actually try to follow the law that's written into the Internal Revenue Code to determine what they owe. Now, clearly there are areas of ambiguity, but much of the rest of the world, the, 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 their tax code is just sort of a guide. You know, it's a, it has hints uh, about what you might wanna pay. So, so the problem is the United States is a country of laws and we tend to try and actually follow them uh, much of the rest of the world just doesn't operate that way. And so we run the serious risk that we have a 15% global minimum tax. The rest of the world either doesn't follow or they pretend to follow, but they really don't follow. And all of a sudden, U.S. multinationals become a target for takeovers by foreign purchasers. And that's part of the reason Yellen's been going all over the world, because she knows if they were raised top corporate rate in the U.S. to 28%, which, by the way, would take us way above the average of the OECD, we would be dead takeover targets. Um, but even if you get 
this 15% minimum tax and maybe only raise the corporate rate to 25%, U.S. companies are still going to be in the gun sites uh, taking over. And one of the problems with corporate takeovers by foreign purchasers, the headquarters jobs go, the, the other jobs go, the suppliers go, end up coming from the country that's been the, the purchaser. And when that happens, those jobs never come back to the United States. Um, so this is serious business. Um, what the US, US multinationals have going for them is so far Ireland is not showing much in the way of cooperation. They have a 12.5% rate. Uh, Hungary has 9%. Um, so I still think they have a long way to go to get this done. And, and also, by the way, people are predicting that the OEC is going to agree to this in meetings this summer. Those people apparently have never been to Europe in the summer. No one works in Europe in the summer. Okay, they're all on vacation. So, so I don't know exactly how they think this is going to happen in the summer. But I, I, I guess my bottom line is it's got a long way to go. Uh, but uh, you can't say it's impossible. Maybe COVID really has caused some changes, Ken. I guess we'll see. Uh, oh, well, to your point, they've actually been meeting by Zoom quite a bit in the last 12 months. So maybe they're going to be meeting by Zoom from San Tropez and Cannes and uh, Greece and other places that they go on vacation. Bad, bad Wi-Fi there. I don't know if that'll work, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, I have a wrap-up question for both of you. I think it's very relevant uh, given both of your tremendous experience in this tax policy realm. And, and the question is, as tax policy continues to be distilled in the coming weeks and months, what are both the most effective strategies you have seen companies engage, as well as mistakes that they make, um, as they may be combing through this and trying to see you know, specific elements that are very impactful for their specific situation. They may act outside of their trade associations or other efforts. What would your counsel be to them at this stage and maybe even later in the process? Go ahead, Juanita. Um, that's a very good question because I think over the last 15 years, lobbying tax bills has become very, very difficult. And particularly if you have a specific issue that is outside one of the large consensus themes like corporate tax, raise them or lower them, individual rates, raise them or lower them. If you're faced with a situation where you have a specific problem with a piece of the tax code and you want it changed, that has become almost impossible to do. And it's made it very difficult for trade associations in particular, um, but, in my, in my role as um, a former um, president of a number of trade associations, it just seems like the lobbyability of some of these bills has become, is, is very much declining because the parties are setting their policies together and they vote as blocks. So it, it's, I just think it's become much more difficult. Um, a trade association president always has to worry about her members. Um, going outside whatever the agreed upon consensus is for the industry. Um, it's happened to me any number of times. It's not pleasant to live through, but it's, it's generally very difficult for an individual company to be able to um, put the heft behind an individual strategy and be successful. It's much better to let your trade associations do that and protect your brands. That's what a trade association is for, is to protect your brands. So, so what I would add to that is... Do you agree? Do you agree with me? Oh, no, no. No, I... No, I, oh, I good. <laughs> um, but, and, and, and so I would only add to it is it's very important to have a concise, simple, and what I like to refer to as one floor elevator uh, ride message. And I, I don't mean to minimize the complexity of some of the things we're talking about, but I'll just use the 199 cap A example that Juanita and I worked on in 2017. Our one floor elevator ride was the pass through business who is the florist, the gas station owner, the drugstore owner is gonna pay a higher marginal rate than General Motors. Now, just to be clear, that was sort of a lie because General Motors has so many net operating losses from their time in bankruptcy, they're probably not going to pay income tax for decades. But but it but it was not a lie in in the sense that C corps we're going to pay a lower marginal rate 
Then the mom and pop passed through businesses on Main Street. And it, it took us a while of banging our heads against the wall and on doors to get in. Uh, but we, it finally it finally got across. Um, and so, so it's important to have a, a, a simple message that is accurate, but, but delivers a clear message to the member of Congress and the staff. And in the international arena, uh, the international tax provisions are more complicated than maybe anything else. But simple messages uh, like the one that, that I talked about earlier, which is if this passes in five years, we're going to have we're going to look up and see a bunch of U.S. multinationals have been purchased by foreign purchasers, and we'll never reverse that. I mean, so you really have to think of concise, impactful, uh, simple messages um, because if you start getting into the nuances of the tax code, you've lost them. Um, I agree with that 100 percent, and I think that's one of the reasons why we ultimately prevailed with uh, Sector One and Lean In Cap A because when we reduced it to that simple fact, the NFIB member is gonna be taxed at a higher rate than ExxonMobil. I didn't use General Motors, I used ExxonMobil. That was as clear as a bell, but it took a while. I, it's still a head scratcher for me as to how long it took for that message to sink in. And it was Orrin Hatch that really was the one who, you know, understood that the optics were not gonna be good. Yep. So a, a simple, clear message is so important. Well, Ken, Juanita, thank you so much for taking the time uh, out of monitoring all of the details <laughs> of this, it seems like ever evolving issue uh, to be with us today, a really collection of so many issues uh, for sharing your insights, your advice, so many details as they stand now, where we project they may be over the course of a great reminder, probably the next several months, not just the next several weeks. Um, and for your advocacy war stories. Ken, I think we'll all be coding things blue and red uh, going forward. That's a great way of, of thinking about uh, intense intensity of, of different elements um, and for just taking us through this topic. Uh, Ken, someone also wanted to let you know, go Bobcats. Uh, I'm not, hopefully that's a good thing, not a needle, uh, but at any rate, passing that along for you as well. So that was that was Jeff Finkel. I saw it. <laughs> gotcha. Thanks, well, Jeff. All right. I do. I do want to say something about my revered colleague Ken Keys. He's there are a lot of tax lawyers in the United States of America, but there's only one with a personality and a sense of humor, and it's Ken. Ken makes this fun. <laughs> Thank you, Juanita. Miles. It's a low bar. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Well, I'd like to remind everyone that you can continue today's conversation and privately discuss your questions or needs related to U.S. or international tax policy uh, by booking a private virtual consultation with Ken uh, or with Juanita through polygage.com. And we look so forward to engaging with you, uh, whether it be, again, for your own needs or as part of another Polygage Power Hour uh, that we will make available to our community, uh, hopefully, again, very soon. So thank you to all of you for taking the time to join us today. We will follow up with a recording and excerpts from today's dynamic conversation. Uh, and I know everyone joins me, Ken and Juanita, in thanking you both again uh, for taking the time to share uh, your insights and advice today. Thank you so much.